Welcome to On The Chain. This is Chip. Jeff is out tonight. So we're going to be hanging together. And I want to just go into a few little things that we're going to talk about today. Believe it or not, XRP is up 22% over the past seven days. That's right, 22%. And our pal Gary Gensler, Gary, Gary Gensler dropped a video today. Today it's Labor Day in the United States where we celebrate obviously the working man and woman and that's what he put out a uh we'll, we'll jump into it and ftx shaking up the nft world a little bit let's jump in let's go guys get ready let's do it welcome to on the chain And we're back, and we are back. So I want to just say, everybody, guys, where are you coming in from tonight? Put it in there. Drop it in there. I just want to let you guys know that I am a bit under the weather. I have been for a little bit of time. Tonight, I'm nursing uh, with this amazing sloth right here. That's right. It's a sloth wearing a top hat and a bow tie. And I'm, uh, I got some ch chai vanilla tea here. Yummy, 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 yummy. Yeah, not my usual. Usually it's coffee, but it's a little bit late for the coffee thing. But um, I just want to let you know, we got a bunch of things to talk about. But if I, if, if my system doesn't cooperate or if I peter out a little bit early, that's okay. We'll just, we'll go with it. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to jump in with this. <laughs> Gary Gensler, man. I mean, can you think of somebody more disingenuous? And you guys got to see this message. If you haven't seen it yet, well, this is the perfect time to take a look at it. But let's take a look at this together. It's a short message. You know, today, like I said, is Labor Day in the United States. It's something that we, you know, we have a day off. We all celebrate, you know, and it's, uh, you know, and it kind of kicks off, kind of gets that school season going again. And uh, it's the start of a lot of things here. You know, we're starting to head towards fall. Summer's really, it's sort of that unofficial end of summer here, at least in the States it is. But I want to play this for you guys. I want you guys to get some feedback on this. But here's Gensler with his Labor Day message to all of us. Here we go animated every day by working families and investor protection. People trying to save for a better future for their family and themselves. Working families are the backbone of this country and continue to help this economy grow. If you're looking to invest and save for your future, we have resources. Please go to investor.gov. I wish you all a happy and safe Labor Day. Okay, so let's just break that down a little bit. First thing he starts talking about is how the backbone of the country are people looking to invest. And yes, we did invest. A lot of people for the first time ever invested. You know what they invested in, Gary? Digital assets. The very first time. The, the, the stock market didn't do it. Derivatives. Uh, the, no, the nothing out there captured their, uh, their attention. But you know what did? Uh, the new asset class called digital assets. Cryptocurrencies, if you will. And, you know, Gary, like the very first part of this, I want to just throw this up there again. He says he's animated every day by working families. OK, here we go. I'm animated every day by working families and investor protection people. What the hell does that mean? He's animated every day by uh, animated by what? What is he animated by? People trying to save for a better future trying to save for, for a their better family, future for their family and themselves. and themselves. Working families are the backbone of this country. That's correct, Gary. And continue to help this economy right. grow. Right. That's exactly if you're right. Looking to invest and save for your future, we have resources. Yeah, they have resources, right? Seriously, I mean, you're, you're going to go. This is the message he's putting out on Labor Day. You're going to go to investor.gov, right? What happened to the investor protections that they were supposed to be looking out for us, right? It's just, uh, it's, Please you know. go to investor. Don't get it wrong here, but Gary Gensler is a enforcer. He has zero, uh, he has zero interest in um, protecting investors at all, but he wants to basically destroy the cryptocurrency market and he also wants to destroy DeFi, right? That's what he said. And he wants to go out to the exchanges and I don't know if this has to do with the, kind of crushing the on-ramps, but you have to really wonder because <laughs> Hans Loaded says his animation on The Simpsons is, is in Mr. Burns. Yeah, that's about as close as it really gets right there. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, just throw out the useless words, says Kelly Slade. Yeah, solid one, Kelly. Uh, John Doe says, God, I incredibly dislike the enemy of the normal folk. And, and this is exactly right, John. Exactly what he feels like, the enemy of the normal folk, right? He does get it right that the, the it's the backbone 
of the working families. But so what's his job? To crush it, right? I mean, basically that's what he's doing. Working families, Johnny Nevermind says working families that are too broke to invest, that that's what they want, right? They want to go crush them. And how about all the people who, when the lawsuit hit, they went ahead and sold their bags or they were very worried about their future, right? How fair was it for them that they erased billions of dollars right off of the top? So yeah, this whole thing is uh, is incredibly uh, disingenuous here, um, w w without a doubt. I mean, with th this guy is absolutely vet bro. What's going on, vet bro? Ratoon. Yeah, and then uh, John Doe says, just because we're not elite doesn't mean we don't understand this technology and investment better than they do. And I think you're right, John, because you know I saw the uh, uh, DNI out there. He was. Uh, you know, tweeting a bunch of stuff. I've seen on Twitter lighten up about, you know, oh, you know, they said this at this conference and so-and-so said this. But, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I really don't care because it's just somebody's a personal opinion of it. And if they got a personal opinion, um, you know, it's like, so what? Everyone has a personal opinion of it. And whether the SEC says that Hinman's speech had something to do with the actual, um, you know, had to do with, with, with the actual, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, <laughs> I hate when this happens, but but it, it, whether it was a personal sort of uh, a come from or it was something that was analyzed and looked over. But but let's can we at least come to this conclusion that anything that is publicly disclosed, whether it's in a speech, whether it's in a um, some public forum, it's been sort of taken apart. And the people who need to look at it looked at it and they didn't find anything wrong with it. And then Hinman does say that this is his personal opinion. But then it, then we ask, well, why the hell, if it's his personal opinion, why the hell would, do we care about this guy? Why, why do we care? Why would you invite a guy like that to a conference? So, yeah, come to the conference. But what do we care about you, Gary? Well, you know, Gary, look, I mean, uh, we just have to um, let you know one thing. I mean, uh, there's there's people that enjoy the uh, the people that enjoy this conference, you know, and it's like they're going to come because they just, you know, you just happen to be at the SEC. But, you know, don't worry about that. That's not too big of a deal. It shouldn't be the the end all be all. And while I'm looking for this other thing right here, if I can see if I can find it, let's see if I can hopefully grab it now. But I want to I did go ahead and put a tweet thread out because I sort of um, wanted to kind of like throw my memorialize my my uh, my thoughts in a in a thread. And um, because everybody else is throwing their stuff out there, but I wanted to jump in this, guys, because, you know, Jeff and I have talked about this a numerous amount of times here. Gary's going to work with Clayton or Hinman. Yeah, Doc says uh, Gary's going to work with Clayton or Hinman when he leaves the SEC. Yeah, and it's just really beautiful to know that when he does leave the SEC, it's all crypto all the time, right? All the time. And then John Doe says, I feel like when we ask the regular citizens what approach with evidence of the SEC choosing to do, an overwhelming percentage would support whatever you choose to call it, XRP, Ripple, whatever. And exactly. That's very spot on right there. And I wanted to jump into this uh, tweet stream um, that I'd thrown out there if you guys hadn't seen it, but I wanted to throw this out there. And uh, let's go here. Here we go. Here we go. So um again so crypto law this is obviously john deaton he sent a message to what digital asset buys dubbed the wall street media this time uh is now for the story to break and be told why did jay clayton and, and william hinman give eat a free pass and sue ripple um which you know i guess everybody's wondering that but again you know if you look at the and then this is uh let's go over here there we go so I kind of threw out this tweet stream a little bit. So first of all, Republican Clayton kicked the lawsuit down to the next administration, a nuclear bomb, if you will. In comes hapless, power tripping Gensler, who taught a crypto course um, at MIT. So he's reminded us numerous times. He's not exactly the savior, but the all-in enforcer who will crush all of crypto and DeFi. And then Gensler, who's too steeped in his own self-righteousness, is forced to carry the water and blurts out, anticipation of profits on the efforts of others. And he ends with, I think it's reasonably clear or very clear. And you guys remember this piece. We did play this here on the chain uh, a bunch of different times, but this is where Gensler says, he says, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's an anticipation of profits on the efforts of others. It can't be, I think it's really, you know, reasonably clear or it's very clear. That's what he says, right? So again, let's break this down. So what is clear is the SEC failed to protect investors. And Gensler attempts to lob the entire crypto landscape into an investment contract prawn of the Howey test. 
Was there a stated intention of Rip by Ripple that based on their efforts, there would be an expectation of profits? Because that's what the investment contract is. So guys, if I missed it, please go ahead and drop that in the chat because maybe I went ahead and missed that. But this is what he's basically saying is that based on the efforts of others, he goes on to talk a little bit about entrepreneurs, that they're um, entrepreneurs, that people are relying on them and their efforts for there to be some sort of a realization of profits. Now, what he's missing is that is never implied, nor is it stated. So him implying it and stating it is mixing it up pretty big time. And you could say that almost about anything, right? You could say that about any crypto thing. Well, why did the Ethereum Foundation? Well, you know, Vitalik Buterin says it, you know, many, many times. He says that they self-funded themselves with some of that ICO sale. And so apparently that wasn't a big deal. But it is kind of uncanny the way they certainly go after Ripple here. And then this argument is weak at best, and Gensler gleefully proclaims the prong of the Howey test, whether it fits or not. Gensler's the chair and the all-knowing, all-seeing SEC lead enforcer. How could he possibly be wrong? He taught a crypto course at MIT, don't you know? <laughs> so now let's break down the body language of Gensler before his statement. He touches and rubs his nose, which indicates he's doubtful of what he's saying. Now, if you guys know... Um, if you guys follow body language and stuff, this is a classic telltale sign. You're negotiating with somebody. They're about to tell you something. They touch their nose like that. It's a sure, uh, sure way of, uh, of sure fire way of there's doubt in what they're going to say, uh, doubt in the ability. And that's what he does. He did that rubs the nose there. And so, you know, look, it does it. Is it a hundred percent every time, you know, possibly, but I mean, in this case here, you know, that was a pretty good solid rub right there. That was a, uh, you know, that was a pretty good spot right there. And then Hester P Pierce, uh, she rolls out the token safe harbor in February of 2020. And then she rolls out the 2.0 version in April of 2021. It's an incredibly well thought out proposal, which would give developers a basically a three year window to fully create a decentralized network. And of course, I put a little link to it right here. And, you know, I've kind of come full circle on this because, and, and as we sort of break it down a little bit more together, I'm really starting to think that Hester Pierce really is, is a prisoner within her own organization. I mean, she's out there doing the very best that she can, yeah, trying to make the right kind of moves, but at least she had the foresight to not only roll it out back in February of 2020, and then you remember there was a lot of hype about it and talk about it. People said, well, you know. Um, three years, a long time to become decentralized. Why don't we change it to two? Well, there's a lot of talk and banter around it, but the bottom line is nothing ended up coming um, <clears throat> to fruition on that. So what does she do? Well, that's back when you had Clayton in there. Now you get a brand new chair. You have in walks Gary Gensler. He basically all but ignores this plan, doesn't care about it. And this is where you start seeing a little bit of break with the leadership, right? You see Hester Pierce going this way. You see Gary Gensler going this way. And, and I'm going to kind of show you a little bit how the politics plays a role here because Commissioner Pierce, she's the lone shining star who's demonstrated beyond a shadow of doubt that she fully understands the crypto universe. So much so that she is able to put together the safe harbor notice. And that gives a, that gives a development team enough time, enough runway to be able to decentralize a token. Now we all know that when some projects get started, surely Ethereum fits into that mold. When they first started out, they, they, they didn't call it an ICO, but they had a token sale. And that token sale funded a lot of what they did. And later it was come out in the him and speech saying that they believe they were a totally decentralized network. Now, if you look back at, go back to the 2013, 2014 of Ripple at the time, you have to look at the nodes and were they fully decentralized? And you could argue that maybe they weren't fully decentralized. How much of it did Ripple run? But we know for a fact that today's today's XRP is not even close to be being a security at this point. I mean, we, how would we find it to be a security when it's got so many use cases and it's completely decentralized? I think Ripple controls, I think, less than... 10%, maybe 8% of the nodes. So basically they're a non-entity. And in order to pass something, uh, let's say, you know, a lot of people have said, well, 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 what about this whole escrow thing? Well, the only way you can change that escrow is you'd have to put it off for a proposal. You'd have to get 80% consensus on the XRP nodes, right? If you don't, 
then it doesn't go ahead and pass. So Ripple has a very, it doesn't even have a horse in that race running 8% of the nodes. It's like, it's like non-existent, but you need that 80% consensus, 78%, not good enough. 70%, no, what about 60%? No, it has to be 80% or higher to be able to pass um, an amendment on the, uh, with the nodes. So she's the lone shining star behind a, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And Gensler's demonstrated it completely the opposite. And he's failed to the, the core mission of the SEC, which is to protect investors. So this message kind of comes out, this message today sort of rubbed me the wrong way. This, this, when I saw this video today, man, I was like steamed. I was like, who the hell does this guy think he is? He's so petty and he's so smarmy that he's going to tell us the backbone of the of, of the uh, of the U.S. and 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 the poor families huddle together with their little bits of you know money and they try to uh, go ahead and make the investment. I'm like, who does he think he is? Do we do we care what Gary Gensler thinks? I mean, no, he didn't protect the investors in this case, and they let it ride for years, you know, seven eight years before they were going to step in and do anything. So. Gensler's demonstrated the opposite. He's failed, obviously, the core mission of the SEC. And he brings it up in a very swarmy way, like, you know, and we, we're here to protect the investors and go to our website and jolly oh good stuff, time feeling stuff. And we'll go there. Yeah, here we go right here. Look at this right here. Jay the Great says, Gary's a follower. He's the predecessor of Jay Clayton. And they might as well be cut from the same cloth. That's a good observation. A very good observation there. And then I want to put this one up here too. Is like uh, an egg says, uh, it's weird how Vitalik, Lubin, and Novogratz became insanely rich between December of 2017 and June of 2018. It's almost as if they sold something they owned a lot of. Yeah, isn't that funny? And uh, in a video we have coming up, we have uh, Joe Lubin. And this is something that, uh, um, you know, I was, uh, uh, I saw this making the rounds today. It was going all over the place. And I wanted to, um, the digital asset investor, he was out there. Um, he was tweeting all this stuff and trying to link a possibility of saying, well, look what happened here. Look at this. This is the evidence we need. I'm like, well, what's the evidence? A guy giving his, his, his personal opinion. doesn't really matter what it is. So Pierce breaks from Gensler in this clip where she states there's a lack of clarity around whether something is or not or is not a security. Now, this is on September 2nd. Now, we know that Gensler, uh, or I should say uh, Roisman and Pierce said in a, in, a, in, a, in a public statement back in July that there's no clarity. Now, she's breaking with him once again. She says, one area where the chair, Gary Gensler, and I don't see eye to eye is the lack of clarity around when something is or isn't a security. Guys, I think this is big right here because this takes a lot of courage for, for someone like a, uh, for a Hester Pierce. And it's kind of like made me reevaluate where she's coming from because she's publicly breaking from him saying, I don't see eye to eye, whether something is a security or not. And I have to agree with her. She unpacks the token safe harbor proposal 2.0, DeFi regulation and more. And she very, and I, and I love this clip because she's not afraid to say, hey, I differ from where the, what the chair believes. I don't agree with Gensler and we don't see eye to eye. Now, Gensler, his whole, his whole come from here is, well, there's so much clarity and uh, there's an investment contract. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously you're, you're basically hoping uh, that through the efforts of others, there will be a price increase, although that's never been stated or implied. And again, this is really weak for him to do that. And I love how Pierce totally nails him here. And uh, is it any wonder that Republicans Pierce and Roisman emphasize the lack of clarity for market participants around the application of securities laws to digital assets and their trading stock in the public statement of the matter of coin schedule? And I think this was by design. Now, you guys have to look. Yeah, okay, there's a little bit of politics going on right here. You got Roisman. You have uh, Pierce, both Republicans. Now, yeah, okay, you could say that Clayton was a Republican as well, which he was, but he was also kind of a stodgy uh, nut nutter as well. But now you've got someone like uh, Gensler, who is a dyed in the wool, um, you know, leftist liberal, right? Who just, you know, is he going to become the enforcer? Um, it's funny when people get into government, they when they get a little bit of power, they start power tripping and they want to enforce everything. And I think that this right here, that public statement, and now you have Pierce again breaking with 
Gensler. I think it's fantastic, and I think it takes a lot of courage. And I applaud. Uh, I applaud. And and she, gleefully she gets back the you know the crypto mom tag because she's been thwarted within her own organization, not by one, not by one chair, but now by two chairs who have completely ignored her as if she doesn't even exist. I doubt they even talk. And if they were standing around the water cooler, I bet you they would just look at each other and have zero words to say, right? They probably could care less. Um, the statement by the two SEC commissioners is a blow to the SEC's effort to thwart Ripple's fair notice defense. If the SEC doesn't have clear guidelines in July of 2020 on whether or not to pursue a digital asset as a security or not, well, how can the SEC successfully prosecute Ripple, right? So you have dissension within your own organization. You know, especially not talking about like years ago, you know, obviously there was that letter written to one of the one of the uh, that, that John Deaton used in one of his filings. But there was the letter saying, hey, we haven't identified whether or not XRP is a security or not. This came six weeks before the filing. And then you have there's all this evidence. And this right here seems to be by design that they are completely thwarting the SEC's effort. And they're just going to, they're just basically impacting this whole fair notice at defense. So many crypto thought leaders believe that a potential settlement between the SEC and Ripple is forthcoming. And Brad Garlinghouse publicly stated they attempted to settle with the SEC before the December 2020 filing. Uh, if Ripple and company couldn't glean clarity from a potential settlement in 2020, well, why would Ripple settle now? Now, there are some potential ways that that could happen and certainly but they wouldn't settle if they would be in the same boat in other words okay well it, now if the sec had come out and said well the sec's uh you know we we really we're, we're looking at the xrp of 2013 2015 we're not talking about the xrp of today now why not that could have been as simple it's it's more or less what they did when they talked about ethereum right they talked about eth today's eth not being uh, a security and be being totally decentralized. So a settlement without clarity around a digital asset XRP would just leave Rip alone for a future forthcoming lawsuit. And again, this is one of the reasons. Now there could be some sort of a summary judgment. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with this with the judge. But again, their fair notice defense is big, and they weren't given fair notice. You know, I mean, eight years went by, and they're still dis discussing internally whether or not. They believe that digital assets are securities. And we saw Hester Pierce break publicly with Gensler. Ripple's assembled a dream team when it comes to defending this case. The defense team made up of previous SEC personnel. Ripple's demonstrated they know exactly what they're doing, and they're methodically shooting holes in the SEC case. Now, the best part of that is that when you have people that know the SEC from the other side, you have Matthew Solomon, who is a, used to be a litigator, and he's now one of the chief people. They know what it's like being inside. They know exactly what it is. You know, it's kind of like if you're if you're if you've been on the inside, you know, anytime there's some sort of an inside job, the people on the inside know exactly what's going on. So they know how to defend this. They know how to attack it. You got someone like a Mary Jo White, who was an ex chair herself. You have other ex chairs that have written letters to uh, back back then Clayton saying they didn't believe at all that it sh this, this should have proceeded. So this case goes to trial where Ripple's defense team really takes the wheels off the SEC's preposterous allegations. The SEC made a huge miscalculation and will suffer the consequences as a result by losing this landmark case. And uh, yeah, I believe that was, uh, well, there's one more here. Gensler's legacy will be forever known as the presiding chair, SEC chair, who lost the case of the century. And I think it's actually really fitting in this point, right? Somebody who came in, high hopes, we all had high hopes for him, thought he would come in and ride in. And, and as Rosalind Layton so cleverly wrote, said he had a chance to, to uh, create a legacy around his, you know, his, his, his actual, um, you know, chairmanship but instead sort of went the other way and became the enforcer and blah, 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 and basically paying lip service to anybody. And so it'll be forever, forever known as the presiding chair who lost the case, a title he learns all on his own through no efforts of others. And that's just a little play in words because of the whole investment contract. He will own this straight up. He can blame whoever he wants. He can cry and moan and, 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 and complain. But uh, Jay says, quick question, Chip, you think Gary, Forces them to produce the SEC holdings to avoid a settlement, seeing that his personal holdings 
wouldn't have to be disclosed. Do you think Gary forces them to produce the SEC? You know, that's a tough one. It's, it's tough to say. Will, will Do they want to? Obviously not. Um, I mean, do they, does Ripple even have the benefit of knowing that? I think um, of going that far, it's hard to say. But again, it's going to come down to really what the judge says in this whole thing and what is going to be allowed or not allowed. But one thing's for sure, Jay, is they did not have a policy, an internal policy, at least it looks that way, around digital assets. And if they didn't have a policy around digital assets, then what exactly are we talking about here, right? And I wanted to play this other, I'm gonna throw this other video up over here. Let me go ahead and stop this for a second and let's go ahead. And, and I wanted to show this one because this video here is of, this is Joe Lubin and Mike Butcher uh, from 2019. And again, this was making the round, so I wanted to throw it up here, but I want you guys to listen carefully, except what Joe Lubin says here. We are big friends and fans of, uh, of that organization. I think they're, they're really understanding the space well. Uh, they are applying uh, this thing called securities law uh, to, uh, business, to business in America and other places, uh, as they have done for, for many decades uh, successfully. They're identifying fraudulent projects. They're identifying obvious transgressions of securities law. Um, but they, they haven't had a heavy um, touch really. Um, they've been gathering information. They've been taking some actions. They've been very clear that they're, they understand there is this new construct, um, this uh, protocol based open platform. Okay, so now he starts. I want you guys to listen to this because he starts talking about this new construct, okay? And there is no new construct. This new construct was made up inside of his head. And so he starts talking about a new construct. So I want you guys to listen carefully. I'm going to back it up a little bit here. But let's listen to what he talks about this new construct. Based open platform. So you think they get it? Uh, yeah. Open platform. So uh, protocol based open platform. Uh, this uh, protocol based uh, clear that they're, they understand there is this new construct. Uh, this uh, protocol based open platform. So you think they get it? Uh, yeah. We believe they get it. Um, they've introduced a new construct decentralization into their thinking. Uh, so in addition to the Howey test, uh, they have this new construct uh, that they're seeing. See, this is the thing when you start getting on stage and you seem like you're very important and, you know, Joe Lubin has a, a phenomenal, you know, he's a uh, CEO of consensus, you know, a re well-respected guy. At the end of the day, it's just some guy speaking on a stage, right? It's a, a, a new construct. They've got a brand new construct and the construct is of decentralization. There's no new construct. So let's listen a little bit more of what he has to say. And I want you to see, listen carefully and how he finishes this. Certain things in, so they consider the Bitcoin network uh, and token um, and issuance mechanisms. They consider the Ethereum network token and issuance mechanisms to be uh, decentralized and uh, therefore no transactions involving those particular assets are considered to be uh, transactions of securities. They have not uh, said the same thing about other tokens, the, the Ripple token, for instance, and they uh, were clear that they were going to come out with statements to uh, to sort of assess these different tokens. Uh, and I believe they've made all the statements about decentralization that, that they're going to make. And so um, Bill Hinman, director of corporate finance, has been very clear uh, about uh, what you can do and what you can't do. And uh, decentralization is a, a new element that they're working with. Hey, by the way, did you see this guy, Mike Butcher? So I hung out with Mike Butcher for two days. Um, I actually had a startup back in 2013, 2014. And uh, I was, uh, I was, uh, he would, he's actually the, um, he's the uh, UK um, editor of TechCrunch. And um, I hung out with him for two days. Actually rode a, bu rode a bus from, uh, from Ireland all the way up to Northern Ireland. And he's quite the character. Um, what a character he is. I will just say that. He is quite a character. And boy, do I have some stories to share about him. But, um, but he's sitting here giving a, you know, an interview, but this whole idea of a construct, this is just ponderous to me. I mean, th there is nothing remotely new about the, con there's a new construct and the construct has to do with, there's a, there's a construct about decentralization. There's no new construct. This is somebody I want to thank Reg. Thank you for that, man. He says time for the FBI to investigate with the SEC staff and officials had advanced notice to policies that retail investors 
did not have. And that's very, very interesting, isn't it, Reg? Yeah, uh, policies that retail investors, we didn't have access to, right? But the institutional investors seem to have known a little bit of the inside baseball, if you will. Isn't that true, Reg? Thank you for that. And then we have XRP Supercar. He says, this might be our best chance to make money or the biggest depression for the next four years. We'll spray paint the what blank until the SEC building goes downside. A little bit of a funny thing there, yeah. Yeah, the funniest way we do it is we just keep hammering them out over on crypto Twitter, which is fun too. You know, you just hammer the hell out of the guy and you make it happen. But this whole idea of a construct, there's a new construct. I mean, this is a guy giving a personal opinion. Now, his opinion is based on the interpretation that Hinman's speech carried some weight and it wasn't a personal opinion, as Hinman says right before giving the speech, uh, especially when it, as it pertains to Ethereum at the Yahoo um, the convention. And he says there's a new construct and a construct. Well, the construct is in Bill's head it's right here. Um, I'm saying, uh, yeah, I mean, when you think about the new construct here, that's where it is right there. It's in his head. I'm sorry, Joe, not Bill. What am I saying, Bill? Joe Lubin. I mean, he really believes that there's a new construct. And again, you guys can put things together any way you want, but it doesn't make it so. This is like, well, the new, and then you have the Ripple token. And it's like, dude, 2019, you still don't know it's not called the Ripple token? You know, why didn't they go after the Ripple token? Well, the Ripple token, the XRP is about as decentralized as you can get, pal. And it's so ponderous. These guys just don't know. They're completely lagging. But, you know, as it's been brought up, as Reg brought up, you know, it's like, there, <laughs> it doesn't really matter because as long as they made a lot of jack, right? As long as they made a lot of money, and it seemed to me that they did certainly, um, they certainly did profit um, from from that going forward. I mean, so I, I look at this kind of stuff, and I'm thinking to myself, it's the worst possible day to to put that out on a day like today, where you think that, well, you know, um, you're going to talk to us and talk down to us and how the little guy invests and saves money. And then here comes the uh, SEC enforcer to go rip all that away. So I, I find that to be a little bit disingenuous, but again, I, it's it's kind of the par for the course here for Mr. Gensler. I wanted to talk this because, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, the ISO 20022 and the adoption, obviously Ripple's ready for it, but this is kind of, I found this to be a little bit shocking because according to uh, benchmarking this article here, it says that there's limited adoption of the ISO 20022 messaging and the RTGS system. But around a fifth of central banks said they use emerging payments messaging technology. So it's obviously the emerging global standard for payments uh, doing messaging. Um, the standard seeks to establish a common language for model payments and transaction data to improve the speed and compliance. The standard also has a scope to reduce the cost and need for manual interventions due to the increased data quality and automation. Surprisingly, central banks have not widely adopted the ISO 20022 messaging in their real gross time settlement. So it's kind of weird. It's like, well, why, why, haven't they, why haven't they done that? I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing to, <clears throat> to sort of wonder about why you can't read the rest of the articles behind a paywall here, but. But it is kind of a, it is kind of stunning that one in five is using it right now, and we're basically, you know, the standard is gone, you know, live. It's going live just in a couple months. But how come the rest of these banks are not even? They're not geared for it, and they're not even paying attention to it, which I find to be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty bizarro. And then I wanted to let's I want to look at this next story here because this is I, I got to tell you every once in a while I see stories and they just always kind of surprise me because. And, and, you know, you guys have to look at Singapore. Singapore is certainly a company that is really, really, really on top, a uh, country that's really on top of things, especially when it comes to all things digital, um, all things, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency related. Let's put this up here. XRP Speedball, thank you. He says, since we're in the new money group, all OTC family should be wear white, should wear white tomorrow. <clears throat> there you go. That's right. White after Labor Day. Break the rule, man. You're not supposed to wear white after Labor Day, but we are rule breakers, man. I love that idea. You know, there was a there was a thing many many years ago. It says you never wore white after Labor Day, except for the rebels, right? And who should be wearing white is Gensler, waving that flag, waving the flag. But I like that idea a lot. 
Yeah, so everybody wear put their best white on tomorrow, and they will show you guys that you don't care. Now, look at this right here. This is interesting. So the quest for the Singapore CBDC winner. Now, this, this is something. So the Monetary Authority of Singapore selected 15 finalists. Can you imagine there's 15 finalists? That shocks me. I can see the we've we've narrowed the field and we've sort of gotten it down to, I don't know, maybe 10 or you know, six or five. But no, no, no. They've narrowed it down to 15 uh, to develop its retail CBDC. They revealed uh, crypto Twitter revealed ties between the finalists and projects partner with the Stellar blockchain. The finalists can be can access the Apex uh, digital sandbox, which includes APIs from all over 100 banking and payment processors. The uh, CBDCs are interfering with existing digital products of the financial sector as more countries test out their benefits. For example, the Chinese Yuan has been tested since 2014. Show 2014, huh? Showcasing positive results for uh, uh, POC, the decline of digital transformation transactions and demand for more digitized projects pushed banks to consider CBDC implementation. As the new banking standard, Singapore is putting CBDCs to the test. <clears throat> and then it goes on to say that um, held between November 28th and November 12th, 2021, Monetary Authority of, of Singapore will select three winners from 15 finalists, each receiving SGD $50,000 or the equivalent of $37,193,000, which seems, I don't know, it seems a little bit on the lame side, but I guess, I guess it's better than nothing. Following the assessment of 300 registrants, at least they got it down to 15. MAS announced that the selection of the 15 finalists for the global CBDC challenge, including participants from the FinTech technology and banking solution sector. Let me just, uh, a second here. I feel like I'm gonna sneeze. And I did. And then luckily I was able to I was able to hit the mute button right away. The uh, global CBDC challenge aims to discover and develop retail CBDC solutions that'll benefit the economies, and blah 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 blah. Um crypto Twitter was quick to illustrate the connections between the other participants and other blockchain projects. For example, Crypto Poet highlighted uh Moja Loop and Ripple par Ripple Partner as an active candidate, yet they did not pass the selection process. Yet, Bit and Stellar Development Foundation, which is spelled wrong there, has been selected by MAS to answer to basically enter the accelerator program. And that's fine. You know, the bottom line is, is that it doesn't necessarily matter who's powering, what's going to matter in this whole thing is going to be when it comes down to CBDCs, you're going to need interoperability. You're going to need liquidity, and so you can use all you can use whatever you want for the CBDC. The problem is, if you don't have that liquidity, if you don't have that interoperability, whether it's a, a fiat currency or any sort of a digital asset, then good luck because otherwise you're going to be you're going to be hurting. So this is one of the things they're not really 100% um, looking at, and so. You know, again, you know, Jeff and I have talked about this often here is that the CBDC, it's just a, a, a digital version of the fiat currency. It's like it doesn't have any bearing on it's not blockchain based. It's not it's just a, it's it's the cool buzzword for now. And all it's going to do is give comp countries the ability to print more. Right. And where what kind of uh, guidelines are they going to are they going to self govern themselves around? In other words, going to say, OK, we're going to create a CBDC, but we're going to basically what's the what's the end plan are they going to roll out and and basically you know deep six the fiat currency or are they looking to add to it is it a slow roll where over a period of time they'll eventually get off of the uh the fiat currency but the bottom line is how are they going to self-govern themselves what are they going to say well i we we think we should uh print uh two trillion dollars worth you know or two trillion uh um uh, and CBDCs or, you know, wh whatever it may be, they've got to come up with some sort of a plan because otherwise, to me, it's just more of the same um, time and time again, which just doesn't, to me, it doesn't bode, uh, bode well. <clears throat> so here's another thing that this was a pretty interesting article here. Uh, African Economist says that regulated cryptocurrencies are reasonable alternative to single trade currency. A Nigeria-based research and development economist, uh, Gospel Obile, said 
called for a unified regulatory mechanism for cryptocurrency trading. He adds that such regulation of cryptocurrencies can potentially complement an African digital currency, hence the need to be considered. So in remarks published by Joy Online, Obili insists that cryptocurrencies have already shown how a single currency must function, the economists explain. Crypto has been able to build a singular markets when it comes to digital currency use and trade across borders. And this is significant philosophy, which the African continental free trade area originates. One of the significant issues that the AFCTA presents is an important opportunity for a singular currency in the African market. We all know this because of the different development stages of financial markets in respective member states. Abili, however, he concedes that the adoption of a single digital currency by all African states seems impossible in the short term. It may prove to be very, very much demanding over time. And, you know, this is kind of like, if, if you look at it, it's sort of like what they tried to do over in Europe, right? So with the euro, they tried to go ahead and and basically create a, uh, a, uh, a one, one currency, although depending on which nation state you were in had a different sort of a nom denomination or bought different things. But that's what that's what Abili is looking to do here. He's talking about what if they were able to create the single digital currency that could be used by all African nations, um, at least all African states. He said some central African banks contemplate launching their own digital currencies. Privately issued cryptos are already being used as a medium exchange um, in cross-border trades, for example, for instance, in Nigeria, where there's a shortage of foreign exchange, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are being used as an alternative means of payment. This helps some import businesses to stay afloat. However, the growing use of cryptocurrencies when making cross-border payments has seen some central banks impose measures that hinder this practice. Commencing, commenting on this, Abile re reminded central banks that cryptocurrency has come to stay. Therefore, instead of trying to restrict the use of such digital currencies, the economist wants central banks to understand the technology that underpins such digital currencies, the blockchain. <clears throat> and this is a really good observation because he's trying to school these central banks into the proper way of thinking. You're not going to put that genie back in the bottle. It's here to stay. He talked about how central banks can be a little bit, um, a little bit rough when it comes to the cross-border payments. He said... We need to go back to fundamentals to get things right, to be part of the crypto revolution. And I think this is ultimately a really good way of thinking right here because his whole mindset of coming at this uh, and tr not trying to necessarily promote a some sort of a, uh, a one token, he's saying he's, I think he's floating the idea saying that's that's a possibility. However, how well could that actually pass muster? Would it actually pass muster? Probably not. But he's floating the idea saying that the real the real pain point is that the central banks are sort of being pretty harsh when it comes to these, uh, you know, to the uh, digital assets and cryptocurrency because they are here to stay. So let me just. Uh... <clears throat> My favorite couch right there. It's a sloth with a top hat and a bow tie. I love that. I have a lot of weird, wacky sort of cups like that. So that's pretty, uh, pretty outstanding, I had to say, right there. And um, there's another cool article that I wanted to get to here. Where is it? My good golly. Let's see. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, that's not the, that's not the article I want to really get into. That's like it's okay. Here we go. This was just a fun little hit, but guys, I mean, if you guys want to know the secret of how to time the markets, I think this is a really good illustration right here. It kind of like really nails it right there. So this is how you time the markets: you buy, 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 buy. See, so then you can totally just you're pretty much going to be guaranteed to be able to do well. This is how you time the market. So I thought that was uh. I actually thought that was pretty pretty clever and and pretty funny. So this one here again, you know, I love when somebody can really. Um, this is Douglas uh, Bonaparte right here, and he is a uh, he's the president of Bonafide Wealth. He's also on CNBC. He's an advisor um, advisor council, and he's also the uh, author of the Million Money Fix. And I love this little statement right here. I think this is fantastic. 
He says, you know, the monthly expenses, mortgage, $3,100, cars, $825, food, $750, entertainment, $625, savings, $300, ETH gas fees, $145,600. Of course, he's making light of it, but that seems to be, it's just amazing sometimes when you get into the gas fees. I've seen so much stuff on crypto Twitter as of late, and that is funny because it's true uh, maybe not $145,600, but yeah, that's that's about the size of it, and that's kind of what we're doing. We're all kind of choking on that at the moment. And um, here we go. So here's another crypto's latest trend, trend right here. Look at this right here. So you guys, crypto's latest trend is to play games before they're even built. So I was like, wait a minute, how does that work exactly? So game developers typically spend a year building a game before they release it. And this is where they sell the in-game aim items, they rake in the profits. Turning that idea on its head, crypto um, DGENs, hang on a second, there we go. Here we go. Crypto DGENs are selling the in-game item first and then hoping somebody is going to build the game. Crypto gaming has taken a strange turn. The new trend in town is to create characters Take them up on adventures, level them up, and then and as well as purchase in-game items as other traits. Now, there's one out there that I saw that was absolutely mind-blowing, going for like 145,000, and it was like a power-up uh, of this, of that, of that. You know, something you would normally watch in a game from you know 20 years ago. And I was thinking to myself, they're selling these power-ups. I mean, they're selling them like the people are buying them up, and there's there's really nothing there other than some words on, on a text here. Those offering the items have no plan to build the game. It's entirely down to the community, do all the heavy lifting, and yet, without any guarantees of any future utility at all, these items and artifacts are selling for millions. Where did it all come from? Well, it all started with a thing called loot. On August 27th, Vine co-founder Dom Hoffman tweeted he would be dropping weird experiment in a little bit, having previously teased the project, describing it as a Dungeons and Degens. A few hours later, he announced loot, describing it as randomized adventure gear and stating there were only 6,000 bags. This is what I was talking about. He provided a link to the Ethereum contract. Members of the crypto community used his contract to create the bags and send them to themselves. It was free to claim the bags, but you had to pay the transaction fees. The 6,000 bags were snapped up in less than four hours. Let me say that again. In less than four hours. What kind of crazy town are we living in right now? In less than four hours, each bag contained eight items for a supposed adventure, a few wearables, and a weapon. Hang on a second. Let me just do this. Here we go. Here we go. Right here. They're named like a mytho myth uh, mythological game, such as Dragon Skin Armor or Platinum Ring of Anger. But these are not real bags. They're not even digital ones. They're simply white text on a black background, saved as images, minted as non-fungible tokens or NFTs. This is what they look like. Here's one right here. You get a war hammer, a hard leather armor, a crown, an ornate belt, lights tear, heavy boots of protection, silk gloves, necklace of perfection, and a gold ring. That's all it is, white words on a black background. The wacky idea is that game developers can build a game or multiple games around these collectibles, assigning them that match the attributes of the bag. So if anyone owns the bags, they might be able to access such items within these yet to be created games. You know, I, I have to say that, you know, a lot of things like strike me as bizarro, but this one right here, it, it's not even the promise of like, hey, we're building the game. You want to be able to get these power ups. These are going to totally, just going to crush it when you guys go out there. You got to have these power ups. Here's what they do. And it was even like, you know, maybe like, Maybe even uh, an image of what they would be. No, that's none of this. This is maybe somebody might build the utility. They might. And this sold out in four hours. So loot's the unfiltered, uncensorable building block for stories, experiences, games, and more in the hands of the community at no cost, its website describes. And despite the lack of any secure future, these bags have become incredibly valuable. Currently, the cheapest price for any loot is 12.4 ETH, roughly around $48,000, while the highest sale was just shy of $1 million for a single bag. Holy shit. What? 
The crypto community has already started experimenting with these bags. A computer graphics designer has already created a set of AI generated images representing the items in each bag. Holders of synthetic loot can see a visual representation of their character. Plus, there's already decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs for loot owners, depending on which type of items they own. This is like, this is really sort of a Dungeons and um, Dragons or Degens, I should say. But, you know, look, it's kind of like we're at the stage now with whoever thinks of something like this first wins. And what do you win? I don't know. And it's like, let's see what this looks like here. Let's see what that looks like. Let's look at that. Yeah, there you go. So there, there's, there's what, that's it. Another 8-bit thing that you bought for 50 grand. Hmm. Pretty interesting. While the infrastructure is being built out, whether it turns into a fully-fledged game or not, well, so what? You already bought it. And if you spent a million dollars for it, good on you. And I think what happens is um, I don't think people would spend real money on this thing. But what I think this thing comes down to is, is early people, people early days that had tons of ETH and they were just, just don't know what to do with it. Because it's like, well, it's 12, you know, 12 ETH. Okay, 12 ETH, big deal. I've got thousands of them. You know, it's not a big deal. But if you had to really spend 50 grand, it's like, you know, 50 grand or put 50 grand on a credit card. I'm not so sure that would easily roll out just, you know, as easy as far as um, would they be as popular? Loot, bloot, and more oots. Within the barrier to entry, as low as thinking up a few thousand names and a bit of blockchain know-how, it's no surprise that a host of projects can recreate loot success and ride its coattails. There are already versions of loot around different types of settlements for any game. Uh, a gauntlet or night city and there's also been a lot of airdrops such as loot and other holders any loot holder can claim randomly generated name FT nft for their character can you imagine this you get the character you get the you you, you you build it all out and you're like yeah i've got everything and what do you end up with you end up with a bunch of white words on a black background and that's what you end up with i thought this is in, this is just insanity i want to check back in with the chat here see what you guys are up to Oh, look at this. Annie says she's not a bag. She's not a designer bag woman. Okay. That's okay. That's all right. So I want to see if you guys have any questions you guys got going on in the chat over here. Kind of like a lot of conversations back and forth. Let me see what else. So yeah. And, I, and then, so I thought this was interesting too, because you have to look at FTX really capitalizing Sam Bankman Freed. He's a smart kid. I don't call him a kid. He's a young man, but he's a very smart guy and he has awesome hair. And I think that's always important. If you have awesome hair like that, there's a lot of stuff going on on that noggin. And I just love this guy. He he really is like a shining star. So FTX.us launches NFT minting platform. Sam Bankman Freed's crypto exchange, the latest to try to get a piece of the booming NFT market. So he says that. Um, you make your own FTs, you, you followed by a fire emoji and then a link to the minting platform. And then he minted as an example, um, the NFTs we built on the cross chain Solana and Ethereum, uh, Bankman Freed said deposits, including those of NFTs not built on FTX.us and withdrawals will open in a couple of weeks, move deep in the exchanges competition with NFT focus. Platforms like OpenSea and Rarible that have seen their daily trading volumes soar in recent months, as well as Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange. FTX's U.S. and global sites previously included NFT marketplaces, but didn't allow users to mint their own uh, tokens. So to list NFTs, creators have to get in touch with the exchange. A few NFTs have already been minted on the FTX.us platform, including one that asks whether NFTs are like Tulip Mania, referring to the speculative market bubble in the Netherlands uh, about tulips in the 17th century. And then this is the part that I love. The platform subsequently introduced a one-time fee of $500 after being spammed by pictures of fish. <clears throat> so he's hoping that if you reduce, if you if you add a five hundred dollar one time fee, hopefully that will reduce the spamming of fish. And to me, the fact that you're going to pay five hundred dollars for to mint it sort of dis destroys any sort of a semblance of why you might want to. Why would you absolutely want might want to go ahead and <laughs> and uh, mint an NFT on the FTX network? Because it's like, are you going to pay five hundred bucks? 
to mint an NFT, it's like, so what? The thing is, is that something like Rarible or OpenSea or any one of the other exchanges out there is like, they have the eyeballs. They've got the people. They've got the, the, the you know, they've got the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> The traffic, you need the traffic for that. It's like, so somebody just mints a one-off NFT of like, I don't know, a bunch of, uh, I don't know, your, let's say it was your third grade report card. It's like, hey, I minted this, an NFT, yay, and nobody cares. You know, maybe your grandmother's excited about it, but nobody else cares. It's like, so what are you going to do? So I think as, as positive as this was, it kind of like burned, it, you know, kind of like went down in flames. Um, I just don't see it happening. But what I do see happening is FTX continuing to grow. It's valued at eighteen billion dollars after a nine hundred dollar million uh, funding round, and this FTX is one to watch. And if you're going to see anybody acquire one of the banking sectors, you're going to see anybody do it. It's going to be Bankman Freed, and he will. I don't know if it'll be a hostile takeover, but he will definitely go all guns a blazing. He certainly will 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 uh, tap that puppy out, and I think it's going to be. Uh, I think it's going to be fantastic. So anyway, guys, I mean, um, thank you for spending the hour with me. We will come back again tomorrow, do it all over, a whole bunch of new stories. If you are in the U.S. today, uh, happy Labor Day. If you're not, I'm going to say happy Labor Day anyway because you deserve it. You work hard, you know, and you invest your money and you've done your research and you know what you, you're supposed to be doing. So and regardless of what Gary Gensler says, we all know that the SEC's mission is to protect investors, whether they have or not. Well, that's that surely remains to be seen. But I will say this. This here is it, the OTC family, the smartest people in all of crypto. Why? Because you guys are thinkers, man. And because you're asking all the right questions and you guys show up here day in and day out. And uh, Jeff and I are super appreciate it. And uh, I want to let you know we broadcast live Sunday through Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time to 9 p.m. Eastern time. I was going to say standard time. I was like, wait a minute, how do you do that? I used to go from Eastern time to standard time. What the, what the heck? And then um, obviously Jeff is back at it on Saturday mornings. He's at 8 o'clock in the morning. And if you're if you're outside, that's usually in the middle of your day somewhere in Europe or, or it's like nighttime for you if you're on the other side of the world in Australia or New Zealand. So that's all I have, guys. I really want to thank you guys for your partnership uh, showing up tonight and we will be back with another banging show tomorrow night. And, uh, just remember XRP is up 22% in seven days. That is spectacular. What's it going to do over the next seven days? Because XRP doesn't care because 99% of the investors live outside the U S and it's not slowing down one stinking bit, not at all. That's all I got. I will see you guys on the next one. Chip out. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.